Um, and just in, in uh, fairness to everybody's schedule, not to run too far over, we're going to go ahead and get the introductions going. We'll probably still have a few people roll in as we get cranked up. Um, my name is Doug Reeder. I'm the president here at Sterling, one of the founders. Um, we're very excited about today's program. It's obviously struck a little bit of a nerve with our, with our friends and clients. Um, these, these programs are getting more traction as we've gone along, so we're really pleased that you could come out and take a little time out of your lunch hour, spend some time with us. Hopefully uh, you'll learn some things today that, that, that you can take back to your businesses. I'm certain that you will. Um, uh, we've got a number of people around the crowd here from Sterling. If you haven't met, please uh, um, reach out and uh, introduce yourselves, guys and gals. Um, I'm not going to go through everybody, um, but uh, we've, got, we've got a nice mix today as well of general contractors and subcontractors. So hopefully, um, there's, if, if you haven't met uh, uh, you know, the folks around you after the program, please reach out because one of the, one of the uh, value adds from programs like this are just putting people together that might benefit from knowing each other and maybe there's some uh, business connections that you can make after the program. Uh, we would sure like that. We, we've enjoyed over the years putting subs and generals together and, and GC partners together on joint ventures and all sorts of things. So um, please, please uh, take the opportunity to introduce yourself after the program. Um, I'm very pleased to have Will Fagan with us here today who's going to do the program. Will is our general counsel who we just recently hired about 90 days ago. Um, he came to us from a construction practice here in Atlanta called Dwayne Morris. Uh, it's based out of Philadelphia. Um, I've known Will for a couple of years. Uh, our spouses work together, so it was a really neat opportunity. We were able to uh, bring him on board. He's got a uniquely uh, qualified background for the position that he's in. Um, his father was a contractor, so we really like that about him because one of the things that he's doing with us is working a lot with our construction group and our real estate folks. But also, um, he's got a variety of uh, business litigation experience. He's done workout, uh, work with banks. Uh, he served as a, a federal uh, court clerk, a federal judge here in Atlanta. Um, he's a very bright guy. He's got a Duke undergrad and a WNL law degree. So um, we just really feel like his credentials and his personality and his temperament and the fact that his dad was a contractor uh, really add up to a nice combination. Um, and one of, the, one of the objectives we've got for when we brought him on board is to do about four of these programs. Um, we bring, as many of you know, we bring in subject matter experts from outside the firm on a regular basis. And we've got a lot of folks in the legal profession that we're friendly with because of the nature of the business we're in. But um, uh, we expect that Will will be a participant in this about once a quarter, which we're very excited about. So this is the inaugural program, and we've had such interest that we've got people dialed in remote, and we're also uh, videotaping it. So if, there's, if you do find some value, hopefully we'll, we'll have it out on our web uh, site in the near future. Um, and with that, I'll introduce Will Fay. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Doug. We appreciate it. And uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you to everybody on the video and uh, dialed in. I'm Will Fagan, General Counsel uh, here at Sterling Risk Advisors. And you are my guinea pigs. This is the first maiden voyage of this presentation and any presentation for me here at uh, Sterling. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions, uh, please forward them to me. Don't hesitate to, to give me a call, shoot an email. Uh, I'm a, an added resource for our brokers. Uh, in, in doing your dealings, you get a contract, you have questions about your indemnification provisions or whatever it may be, contact your broker. They'll get me involved and uh, we can help you out. <clears throat> Why people hate lawyers. I'm going to hit you up with a couple of disclaimers. I am not your attorney. And I'm ethically obligated to get that out there. My only client is Sterling Risk Advisors. Um, and you can read those on the, on the slide deck here. I won't bore you with all those, but I've got more. And there's some of, the, <laughs> some of the back end, too. I've got a nice little disclaimer sandwich for this whole thing. So just to, just to foreshadow that. Here's the agenda for today. I'm going to go through a real quick hit on Contracts 101. I'm going to get to the promised top 10 contract provisions from an insurance perspective, and then we'll take some time for questions. An entire semester of contracts, so I feel like I need to you know, put this on you at the risk of you know, uh, killing your appetite. The contracts, as I think a lot of people know, are 
you know, you need an offer, you need an acceptance, you need consideration. The parties must have legal capacity to contract, uh, have to be of legal age, <clears throat> can't be uh, any impairment, um, uh, such as being under the influence <coughs> or the rest in entering into the contract, and a legally permissible objective. A uh, drug dealer can't sue a, a customer to try to enforce a, a drug deal in a court of law. But the way that we all should look at contracts is it's a roadmap. It's putting together the terms, including payment, which can sometimes be the most important for all of you, the legal remedies, the obligations of each party, uh, and how any disputes will be resolved. Another way to look at contracts is this is the first phase of project delivery for all of you. I had a great idea. I was going to take the Sports Center top 10 graphic. I don't know if you all have seen that, but they, they have a little ball that comes after the, the numbers and all. But that's the extent of our marketing department. It's Sterling, of course. That's all I had. I promise you I'll work on that for future uh, presentations. That's the information we've got. So, we get into this top 10. I want to warn you that what I'm about to show you are contract provisions drafted by actual attorneys. Number 10, survival. Let's begin at the end. Usually in contracts you'll have what are called general provisions that'll end up at the end of the contract and by that point you're probably so tired of reading through it that you kind of whip right through those. Survival is a really key uh, provision in a contract and it allows for certain provisions to survive the end of the performance of the contract, whether that be an indemnification <laughs> provision um, or other, other provisions. So let's take a look. Now, apologize for the quality of the slide, but this is actually taken out of the contract. The terms of this subcontract and the contract document shall survive and remain in full force and effect after termination of this subcontract and completion of the work. This is very broad. This is essentially saying the entire contract is gonna survive. This is not the best provision to write um, in case this, a dispute about this contract ends up in court. A better provision, at least from my perspective, is name out the articles or the provisions of the contract that will survive performance. So here I've got in black what those would be uh, titled. So articles 3, 5, 7, and 12 covering scope of services, limitation of liability, Identification and dispute resolution shall survive the completion of the services under this agreement and the termination of this agreement for any cause. This allows, makes it clear to a court looking at uh, looking at the contract and the dispute that these um, these certain obligations will survive even after the contract is in a sense completed. Number nine, choice of law. This is going to be a key driver for what law is going to apply to the, to the dispute uh, regarding any contract. <clears throat> the best practice is, especially in construction, is to use the law of the state where the project is located. It's a lot easier uh, and it's, and it's going to be more likely to be upheld by a court. If, let's say you have, but in, in another sense, let's say we have a lot of projects in a lot of different states and they're all put into one contract. <clears throat> the next best way to go about is to use the law of the home state of one of the parties. Uh, usually the owner would be the way to do it. So this is a whole lot of language. This is a South Carolina project. Uh, this is a very detailed choice of law provision. Um, essentially the validity, interpretation, performance of this subcontract shall be governed by the law of South Carolina, South Carolina with a number of uh, exceptions. That's a lot to read. Sometimes that might apply to your, to your project, it may not. Uh, a better way of doing it, nice and succinct, is this participating institution agreement shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of the state of Georgia without regard to conflicts of law principles thereunder. Now, this last bit, without regard to conflicts of law principles thereunder. Let's say we have a contract you're selling goods, but all the con all the uh, all the transactions are going to be in the state of Florida. 
but in the contract it says state of Georgia does not have this last phrase on the end. If suit gets brought in Florida, there's a chance that a Florida court could decide that, well, you know, the performance of this contract happened in the state of Florida. The parties are in Florida. All the payments of, were made in Florida. The state of Florida has a, has a greater interest in applying Florida law to this dispute than Georgia law. But putting in this last little bit here, that signals to the court both parties have agreed that no matter where the performance is or where the suit arises, Georgia law should be applied. So I would also, in determining what your choice of law is, consult your attorney as to which law is most appropriate for the contract, uh, what would be most advantageous for the parties um, in determining which state you want to go with. Um, for those who have uh, follow the financial markets. A lot of those disputes, uh, as an aside, they use either Delaware law, because a lot of corporations incorporate in Delaware, or New York law, because it's the financial center of the country. There's been a, a great amount of case law that uh, bears on business issues. Statements that you can make about, like, I mean, from our perspective, insurance, insuring projects in New York is, you know, that's like one of the most regulatory intense states in the country, I would imagine litigating under New York law that for a Georgia contractor is something you want to avoid. <coughs> one of the, the big, you know, gotchas on, you know, whether it's Georgia versus another state, statute limitations, indemnity provisions. Um, I don't know if I know any real specifics on that. Um, but, you know, in, in Georgia law, you're going to be, your, your lawyers are going to be more familiar with Georgia law. Um, and, you, like you said, regulations in, in different states, you're going to want to consult an attorney who, who understands the full plan of what you're looking at um, from a legal and regulatory perspective uh, in trying to figure out what law should apply. You should write into your contract. So number eight, waiver of subrogation. I like definitions. So subrogation is the principle under which an insurer that has paid a loss under a policy is entitled to the rights and remedies belonging to the insured against a third party with respect to any loss covered by the policy. <clears throat> this allows the insurance company to step into the shoes of an insured once they've paid the loss. They step into, you, know, you have a loss, some third party causes it, insurance company pays that loss, steps into your shoes legally, and then sues that third party to try to recover the loss. Subrogation is a way that you transfer the risk to the insurance company uh, on any losses. Waiving it provides a finality to these claims. <clears throat> let, me, let me unpack that. By waiving subrogation, you're parties are agreeing that, that their insurance companies will not have the right to step into their shoes and sue the other party. Now, in construction and real estate, it's become common practice to waive subrogation. It provides finality to the claims, it lessens the threat of litigation, and it facilitates the transaction. Insurance companies will, almost in all situations, allow for waivers of subrogation that are included in contracts because they can't write insurance otherwise. Um, this is really a, kind of a market-driven issue. So, real quick, what this looks like. With respect to the insurance required to be furnished by this agreement, subcontractor and its sub-subcontractors and their insurers hereby waive all rights of subrogation against the contractor, the owner, and their officers, agents, and employees, and any other entities or persons required by the contract between, between the contractor and the owner. From a practical standpoint, y'all's programs that we're insuring you automatically include the endorsements necessary in the policies to waive subrogation when required by a contract. Um, where this might come up, if you're an upstream party, so you're a general or you're a sub that has subcontractors, um, this is something that you should have in your provisions downstream 
occasionally you will get some pushback on it from somebody who's maybe not informed about construction. So if you're in a smaller town market and you're dealing with some you know, smaller town subs that may be insured by an agent who's a generalist, you may get some pushback on a provision like waiver of subrogation. But generally, uh, the idea here is, is that the contracting community has determined that if everybody waives subrogation against each other, you can avoid uh, cross claims that would come out where there might be you know, some negligence on behalf of one of the parties to the contract, even though the, the major uh, negligence or the scope of work out of which the claim arrives is, is obviously the, uh, the, the contractor performing that work. And so the idea is we're going to make you insure sufficiently so that we can cover foreseeable events and, and have everybody agree to waive subrogation against each other so that you don't end up with a bunch of cross claims. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> Laws. Now this standard is frequently modified in a lot of contracts. So let's look at one real quick. Plans and specifications will comply with all applicable federal, state, and municipal laws, and rules, regulations, and ordinances of every nature and description, including without limitations, zoning, building, disabled access, fire, health, and sanitary codes and ordinances, and subdivision control and environmental laws, rules and regulations, including without limitation, the Federal Clean Air and the Federal Clean Water Act as amended, and state laws and regulations consistent with the requirements of such acts. And the project is constructed in accordance with the said plan and specs will likewise comply. So what's the problem with that? It's just a contract provision requiring compliance with the law. Does anybody have a problem with that or, or have a problem with making the other party agree to complying with the laws? Let's take a closer look. First off, plans and specs will comply with all applicable federal, state, and municipal laws, rules, regulations, and ordinances of every nature and description. I'll submit to you that that's uninsurable perfection and compliance. <coughs> Common law only puts in a non-negligent standard of compliance with laws. Another problem that you run into, you've got all these local municipal laws, rules, and regulations, and ordinances. That's left to the discretion of local officials. So you could be following the plans and specs in federal and state law, and if a city thinks that you're <coughs> violating the zoning rule, you're in breach of this contract. On top of that fact, this is all complied with all applicable federal and state laws, regulations, and ordinances. What happens if federal law and state law conflict? The federal law will most likely preempt state law. However, you're not in compliance with this contract because you're in violation of state law. In general, too, when you're reviewing contract language, these are, this is a good illustration. Anytime you see all every any of any every nature generally that's language you want to modify out of your contract and it's unfortunately it's extremely common that you see this in contracts this is something we push back on regularly um, we also ensure a bunch of architects and engineers they take the same position with this the laws are conflicting it's almost guaranteed that you're going to have conflicting uh, construction ordinances, codes, and laws that would apply to a project. Correct. Now, when we get down to the bottom here, I feel a little bit better if we can clean up the top and not make it all in every. <clears throat> but we get down here to, including without limitation, the Federal Clean Air Act, as amended, Clean Water Act, as amended, and state laws and regulations consistent with the requirements of such acts. In this part alone, they've spelled out what, what's, what are they really getting at? What are they really worried about? They're, they're worried about environmental compliance. You also see this in the immigration context, much more nowadays than perhaps before. 
But that's that's being explicit of what your what the parties are going to demand be complied with, and it's a whole lot easier for the parties to know what we're talking about. So, if you know, you can if you're negotiating a contract, consider just striking this because the common law duty is implied to comply with laws. That's that's just inherent in any con contractual relationship. But if you want to have a compliance with laws, I would recommend that you spell out exactly what the laws are that you want complied with. And that's something to bring up with, with your attorney and the other side. Number six, liquidated damages. Excuse me. Now, liquidated damages, you'll see in a lot of contracts, this is these are these are damages for certain overruns or delays uh, that are ascertained before performance of the contract. And from the vantage point of the parties, as they enter into, right before and as they enter into the contract, it's very hard for them to ascertain what those damages for delay, for instance, delay, are gonna be. So they come up with a measurement that's reasonable in all likelihood to say, you know, if you go over uh, construction delay, we're gonna have a rate per day that you'll have to pay. The, the key with the liquidated damage is to make sure that it's not a penalty. Because the court will kick those out. <clears throat> and it's the amount, so on. But normally, you yeah, have yeah. So let's take a look. This is a really, I think it's a really good uh, provision for liquidated damages. Because it is difficult to definitively ascertain and prove the amount of said damages, inclusive of, inclusive of but not limited to expenses for inspection, superintendent's loss of use and necessary traveling expenses, the owner, CMGC, and using agency hereby agree that the amount of such damages shall be the daily rate specified in the contract, beginning upon the contraction required material completion date and ending on the date that the certificate of material completion is issued. The parties agree that the specified liquidated damages are not established as a penalty, but are calculated and agreed upon in advance as a fair and equitable amount reasonably estimated in advance to cover losses to be incurred by the owner and using agency for such a delay or interruption in view of the uncertainty and possibility of ascertaining actual damages. Let's take a counterfactual. Liquidated damages will be not one time the daily rate, but three times the daily rate. Period, full stop. The court's going to look at that, and that's not actually necessarily a liquidated damages provision. That's a punitive provision, and they're probably going to con construe that against the owner. But here, this provision is, is letting, the, letting the court know and letting each other party know what they're agreeing to and how they came to agree on this daily rate. They're being very clear in, the, in this contract. <clears throat> Another problem with liquidated damages. If the liquidated damages exceed the actual damages suffered as a result of the loss. The excessive damages could be excluded under the policy. So if the actual damages are really the daily rate, but you've got a liquidated damages provision that says three times the rate, you may not have coverage for two times that rate. This also has implications for bonding. <clears throat> Okay, we, we execute bonds on on behalf of many of the people here, and this if if you if you have anything to do with submitting bond requests to us, one of the things we ask you to give us is the liquidated damage provision. Um, Will makes a great point about the insurance side of that, because um, you know if there's not a bond in place, then then our perspective is we're we're trying to look at the insurance implications of that. His point is, is, is valid, um, but beyond that, um, if you're if you're providing a performance bond, that's of interest to the surety because that's a contractual provision that they'll be asked to uh, to make good if for some reason uh, you were unable to do that. That's the reason they they have the interest in it. Um, they, from their perspective, liquidated damage provision is significantly better than any language in your contract that has to do with actual damages. Because think about the example of you're hired to do a renovation in a casino and you know it's got a hard deadline on delivery. Um, if, you're, if you're unable to deliver that, 
the, the damage is suffered by the casino for not being able to uh, host folk, host gamblers can be many, many times the value of your construction contract. So, and, th and there are horror stories where bonding companies were held to that because uh, the contract, the underlying bonded contract had actual damages in it. And there's examples where, you know, the actual damages were $15 million, the construction value was $2 million, something like that. Um, so, you know, that's the other side of this. So this is an extremely important provision either, either way, whether we're bonding it or not. Um, any, any questions about that? I mean, we, from an underwriting perspective on the bonding side, we would absolutely love to see liquidated damages of $250 a day, $500 a day, something that is defined like this, not as a penalty, but it's just a substitute for actual damages. That's, that's the best outcome. That's very quantifiable. You can figure out whether your schedule is ample or not, and you can build in, if, if need be, additional money into your into your budget to handle that risk. Um, but absolutely, we we would prefer as your risk advisors that you you know stay away from actual damages, especially on buildings that are have anything to do with you know a profit making enterprise that's on a short fuse. I mean, if you're building an auto plant or a refrigerated warehouse or a hotel, any of these things that rely on people being in them and generating rents, you know, the actual damages could be w way beyond what you could define and agree to consciously in your contract. To piggyback on that, if you're not in the construction business and you're not doing bonding, you're self-insuring generally your liquidated damages if you're taking those out of the contract because your insurance is not going to kick in. What is the perspective that you're taking here? I'm, I'm a, a specialty subcontractor. I'm sure we have owners, GCs. The perspective you're taking here, is this on the GC side or, or are you looking at purely from an insurance carrier is the way you would view it? I, I would say that we're looking at it from both sides because we, we actually represent both sides. So we're most interested in trying to trying to negotiate agreements that are fair to both parties. And that's always in the eye of the holder, right? Correct. That's and we and we understand business decisions have to be made. Choice of law is a perfect example. If the owner says, you know, it's Amazon, and they say we're going to litigate this in, in uh, California, if you want the contract, you're going to have to agree to that, most likely. But we, we get it. I mean, I, we're trying not to be biased in that regard. If I'm paying someone to build it for me, I'm going to have to have premium to have this clause in there, or no? Uh, theoretically, I mean, it depends on actually the, the, the schedule relative to real life. <laughs> if the schedule is ample, the contractor is likely not to build contingency in for this. But if they feel like the schedule is unrealistically short, they're going to add money for each day that's, that's outlined in the LDs. If you're in the manufacturing business and you're shutting down somebody's line, you may have to take this cut. What do you do in, in a case of a subcontractor being held up by other trades or for the GC? Uh, what, how would you write that? Well, we're a little feedback. Thank you. I don't know how to. I'm sorry. Say the question again. The question was, as a subcontractor, if you sign a contract with liquidated damages for time to be done on time, and it's the fault of other subs or, or the general contractor. That's typically my concern about signing contracts like that. Trying to seek language that would, that would carve that out, and we do see that. Where if it is a small number of the parties, it would yeah. not be a lot of You have to prove that cost. They, I mean, being coming upon them. Other trades hold up other trades. Correct. But, and that is a carve out that you could insert to uh, to remove that risk for, for this trip. I mean, you're going to have to, you know, that's going to be litigated, right? So it's not going to be full. Or, 
right. it's going to help. It'll give you an argument. But it's typically done based on proportion of responsibility from general contracting down to the road. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, Sorry, we got a little uh, feedback. We have a mic in the table, or maybe in the ceiling, mic picking up, um, picking up sound. Um, but we will fix that at a later time. I think. So number five: representations, warranties, and certifications. As far as warranties, the common law, and by the common law, I didn't really introduce that. Common law is what we inherited from England. You know, judge-made law, um, and it's come down, and it's, it's judge-made law in the United States. Um, common law imposes certain implied warranties in every contractual relationship. Um, but parties often desire their own warranties. Party. 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 Yes. Calling has to mute. Yeah. That's what it is. It's an echo. It's not it's not it's not it's there. There's anybody on dialed in if you can. Of contract and subcontract by law of the state where the project is located. <clears throat> We're talking about taking positions. In contract drafting, you should you should expressly negate the implied warranties if you don't want them to appear. Here, it's just warranting and guaranteeing everything. But let me give you an example. This is a this is actually a medical contract. PHI is, is personal health information. It's provided to the business associate solely on an as-is basis. Covered entity disclaims all other warranties, express or implied, including but not limited to implied warranties of merchantability, non-infringement, and fitness for a particular purpose. You also see this in a lot of equipment leases. We've seen this you know, It'll uh, negate uh, implied warranties, such as fitness for a particular purpose. Uh, most commonly eliminated implied warranties are merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose, and habitability. So let's say you're making a, you build a multi-family, this might be a crazy example, but you build a multi-family apartment complex, you do everything to the, to the project specifications, you build it. But for whatever reason, there's not a, there may not be an HVAC system in the, in the specs, and you're in Miami, Florida, and somebody moves in and they sue on the basis of the implied warranty of habitability. You're still, if you don't negate them, you can still be on the hook for them, for those damages. <clears throat> there are also, same goes for statutory warranties. Uh, a, a typical statutory warranty is a uniform commercial code, which imposes merchantability, fitness, and title. In, for representations and warranties, uh, you see these a lot in, to go back, in the mergers and acquisitions arena. Parties are making representations and warranties in the contract documents, and those representations and warranties are so important that the insurance industry has stepped up and you can, you can write representation and warranty insurance uh, to cover any inaccuracies that are made uh, in those reps and warranties. Um, Reps and warranties insurance is a viable, can be a viable alternative to putting a lot of money into escrow funds, which you have to put on the sideline. Uh, reps and warranties insurance is going to be a lot smaller, cheaper than uh, than putting a, a sum into escrow. Um, so, good example, uh, you've got a you're buying a gas station, and they've got an underground gas tank, and they warrant or re represent that the gas tank is in good repair. Turns out the thing's corroded, gas is going into the water table, there's all sorts of issues, and you've bought that gas station. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of an example of a, of a rep and warranty you can sue on. Um, let's see. As far as certifications, the thing you need to be worried about is qualifying those certifications. If you don't, um, if you don't qualify it in a, in a professional opinion, um, of whoever the author is or the best knowledge and belief of one of the parties, 
uh, you can, those can be construed as a statement of fact, and they will be in any litigation on the other side, I can tell you that. Um, so that is reps and warranties. Number four, standard of care. We're coming into the home stretch and getting into a lot of the meat. Like I was saying, common law imposes a duty of care on pretty much every relationship. And business transactions, liabilities, and costs can be imposed on any of the parties. And, and they impose a, a common law negligence standard. So you have the common law standard of care, then you have the contractual standard of care. Um, I'm using an example of a design professional for this. Uh, standard of care for all professional services performed or furnished by a consultant under this agreement will be the care and skill used by members of consultant's profession, practicing under similar circumstances at the same time and in the same locality. But what if you want a higher standard? Professional liability policies cover solely negligent acts, errors, and omissions in the performance of professional services. Those same policies commonly exclude coverage from claims based on a higher level of the standard of care that exceeds a common level, common law level negligence standard. Doug brought up earlier, watch out for absolutist language. So anything that requires you to perform to the highest professional standards is raising the standard above common law negligence. <coughs> This is becoming a bigger issue too, particularly if you have if you do any work where there's design build scopes. Okay? And that may not mean that you're doing the whole project design build, but you've got scopes of work. Maybe you're a prime contractor, you've got scopes of work underneath you that may be being performed design build. Um, you don't want to subscribe to a higher than normal standard of care for the design component for sure. And this is something that uh, your counterparty will try to, to hold you to. <clears throat> so this, I've got the CNA Professional Liability Pollution Incident Liability Insurance Policy from 2010 up here. Exclusions. It says, we will not defend or pay under this policy for any claim of contractual liability out arising out of be the liability of others you assume under any oral or written contract or agreement However, this exclusion shall not apply to your liability that exists in the absence of such contract or agreement. So there's your common law, absence of such contract or agreement. Um, other absolutist language to avoid, all complete, finest, most economical. Those are, those are <coughs> alarms should go off in your head when you're looking through those. These can lead to unreasonable client expectations, and they can also raise the standard to approach strict liability. Number three, insurance requirements. I'd be remiss if I didn't add this to the top ten for this audience. <clears throat> so this ties in with the waiver of subrogation we, had, we saw in number eight, um, insuring certain claims to certain limits. When you get to the insurance requirements section, that's a key to call your broker. Make sure that you've got coverage for, for whatever the contract is calling for, whether it be GL, auto liability, or what have you. So that's a key kicker for, for right, right there. We will help you make sure that that provision has, is consistent with industry terminology, and we can help you also assign uninsurable risks to one of the parties contractually. <coughs> So this is this is a big big key for you all. Commonly, you will see these uh, the insurance requirements will be pulled out and put on a schedule. So um, make sure you have the entire contract. Kind of goes without saying. Um, but this this is just making sure that the subcontractor shall provide and pay for insurance coverage as specified in Schedule D. <clears throat> the types and the limits and types of insurance required by the subcontract are the minimums required and may not be sufficient to meet subcontractors' insurance needs. So there may be minimums in that contract, but you need to take a look at what the project is. You may need more insurance than what the minimums are. And we can help you determine um, what that case may be. 
Uh, the limits and types of insurance required by this subcontract shall not relieve, reduce, or limit the liability of the subcontractor. Such insurance shall remain in effect for three years after completion of the project. If the project includes residential property, the insurance provided shall not exclude residential work. Such exclusion shall be considered a material breach of this subcontract. So right here, I know how long we gotta get it for, three years after the completion of the project. And they're letting me know, don't you know, read this entire section. Don't skip over this last sentence. Because you may have residential work, and if, if you don't get that insurance, um, that'd be a material breach of the subcontract. Does everybody understand this provision? It says limits and types of insurance required by the contract shall not re re really reduce or limit the liability of the subcontractor. I mean, what they're essentially saying is, okay, we're, we're, we're requiring, we're holding you to a standard of insurance limits and, and types and structures and deductibles. But, you know, if the damage that you uh, inflict on us or another contractor on the site are in excess of those, that doesn't mean that's the end of your exposure. And you know, I don't know that it, you know everybody that we deal with understands that. Um, uh, it's typically, you know, so if, if the company's got, uh, if a company is a bonded entity, and most of y'all have to retain capital in your business, um, the balance sheet's what is, what is at risk above your insurance on it. So you decide for business purposes that you know you carry a one million dollar umbrella, which is a common. Uh, basic requirement in contracts for counterparties some some significantly more than that but many times uh, prime contractors pushing downstream they're they're requiring a million dollar umbrella over a you know one million per occurrence two million aggregate general liability program um, you know you've got a five million dollar balance sheet and you have a three million dollar claim that's not enough coverage and the balance sheet will be in play based you know, clearly from that provision. Right. Question, do you guys recommend that you know, your clients send you a copy of the contract and let you review, just review it in, in totality? Um, we, we, we certainly recommend that the, that the contract be reviewed materially, either by us and or your own attorney or your own <coughs> appliance people, you know, your project people are sure. responsible for that. Um, we, uh, depending on our role in the transaction, um, you know, many times we're looking at a, at a contract and we're not brokering a bond, for example, where there's near performance guarantees, um, we typically would uh, limit our scope of review to the insurance Sure, and the indemnity provision, which is what we do now. Okay, yeah. um, you know we have a significant practice in bonding contracts, and so in those cases, I mean we we essentially look at the whole thing because the the penalties, the you know there's there's other provisions in the contract that would be germane to the, to the surety um, uh, as as to distinguish from the insurance here. All right. <clears throat> you know, send us that exhibit for sure um, to take a look at in detail because these things are very, you know, they can be several pages. Um, all these big companies have, you know, risk manage management departments um, and they can be very, very specific as to what, you know, forms they're calling out, addition dates. I mean, it's, it's gotten extremely detailed over the last 20 years. And so, you know, just a quick glance at that by your project people is generally not going to be sufficient to, to determine whether that's, you know, something that number one, you're in compliance with. Number two, if you're not in compliance with, you know, what can we do to either negotiate the language or buy additional coverages? And then you're going to want to have those costs before you commit to a final number. And we can help you with all that. All right. Limitations of liability. So, to the fullest extent permitted by law, the client agrees that the total liability in the aggregate of consultants and all of their people to the client and all of their people uh, for any and all injuries, claims, losses, expenses, or damages whatsoever arising out of resulting from in any way relating to consultant services, this agreement and the addendum for any cause or causes shall be limited to, I've got two options here, 
the available proceeds and insurance coverage as a way to limit the liability, or the total amount of compensation received by consultant, whichever. <coughs> Quick word on damages. Where are we at? Right here. You have, you have direct damages, you have indirect damages. Direct damages are those damages that flow uh, foreseeably and naturally from the breach. Let's say you have a fixed uh, you know, contract for a fixed price for a fixed term. X amount of dollars are going to get paid over five years. The one party cancels that contract in year one. Well, we know what the direct damages are. Those are all laid out. That's years two through five. And those are foreseeable. That's what the parties contemplated before they entered into the contract. <clears throat> Indirect damages do not flow directly from the breach. And consequential damages are a kind of indirect damages. Those are the kind of the upside in litigation. That's the stuff you need to be worried about from a liability perspective. So let's say there's a there's a I got an example out of New York. There was a 20-year county signed a 20-year contract for to build a baseball stadium for a franchise. The county failed to bring to begin construction as scheduled. The company sued the county for lost profits for the baseball franchise. Okay. Okay, we weren't able to operate our, our minor league baseball team. We've lost all these profits out here. The award was overturned at the appellate court because the parties failed to contemplate liability for lost profits from the baseball franchise um, in the contract. Those damages, from the perspective of when the contract was entered into, were unforeseeable uh, and depend on the actions of a third party. So courts aren't going to allow those um, in that circumstance. The best practice for consequential damages is to either have an express waiver of them or to expressly cap them as a way of damages to limit liability. And some policies have exclusions for indirect and consequential damages. As an example of different consequential damages which have been listed by different companies and SEC filings include loss of earnings, profits, revenue from ancillary transactions, loss of use of an asset, loss of business reputation or goodwill, loss of business opportunity, lost sales, lost contracts, loss of management or employee productivity, wage, salary, inflationary rise in the cost of labor due to delays, increase in financing costs, cost of capital and fees. So don't leave these to the courts, expressly waive indirect damages. Something to note there is, um, you know, when you talk about reviewing contracts, I mean, um, a lot of folks look at AIA documents as sort of industry standard, or maybe consensus docs if you're a, you know, a member of any of the construction associations which have kind of got behind those documents. They've included provisions that are the way of consequence of damages. And so, you know, when, when your folks or you are reviewing contracts, you know, a lot of the provisions, you know, the, the, uh, the paragraph titles are very similar, you know. Um, and one of the ways you can, you know, you can do a, a rudimentary review of a contract is just line up your AIA contract, your consensus docs contract, next to the one that you're trying to negotiate. Um, by and large, the provisions in those two contract forms are insurable and they're neutral as it relates to who, who bears what risks. The, that the theory behind it is the, the party best able to control that risk is the one that's supposed to be bearing the risk. That's not the theory behind, you know, owner or upstream contractor written policies, I mean, or, or contracts. I mean, it's just generally one side's taken, you know, using their leverage in the transaction to, to keep as much risk off of their entity as possible. That's just the nature of it. Um, so those documents can be really good tools. Another thing that I would point out here um, is this available proceeds of insurance, okay? If y'all, any of y'all are doing design bill work where you're engaging engineers and architects, which is pretty common these days. Uh, most of my clients do this from some time or, at some time or another. That's a common strategy of the professional community is to limit the amount of their damages to their fee. I mean, I'll bet I get a call on this about every two weeks. Um, that's something you don't want to do, okay? If somebody designs a building for you, 
or a, a complicated HVAC scope or the electrical circuits for an entire building, um, you know, their fee may be a few hundred thousand dollars. The damage that could result from a defective, you know, an error in emission in the design of those systems clearly would be well, you know, multiples of the fee. So that connection, that's a strategy uh, to severely limit uh, your, your protection. And, if, you know, and if they've got coverage, which is also something you should be underwriting, right, is how much coverage does my professional uh, provide me with? And over the years, that's gotten better. Um, historically, as somebody who mostly insures contractors, although we do insure professionals, many professionals in this firm, um, historically, at least in the AE community, the limits that they carry have been significantly uh, less than they than their exposure. Um, you know, if somebody designs nothing but hospitals. I mean, they've got high exposure out there on some of the hairiest you know systems and uh, structures around, and their you know that policy, the pro, that program that they have is out there for all those buildings. You know, there's, those limits don't apply at each building. They, they apply across their portfolio of risk. And this is a very, very common strategy when you're negotiating AE contracts, is that the first cut, if, if they write the contract, they're coming in with a limitation to, their, to the amount of their fee. You want to stay way away from that. Does that make sense? Has everybody seen that? Um, but we see it all the time. In the case where an owner is contracting for the design and he knows there's no deep pockets with the architect, then anything that could be negative great, great point. part of the architect is still coming after the contract because that's where the insurance coverage is. Which, and I would tell the GCs in the crowd, and you guys know this, and so you probably negotiate this, but that's something that even though they're not contracting with you, you certainly have a right to know about that and you you know it might be something where you try to negotiate a project specific ENO program to supplement the insufficient limits of the architect or uh, some other way to mitigate that but that's a that's a, a very good point is that you know you're not contracted with them in that case but you know you certainly know who the architect is right and so you should be you should ask to drill into that because you have a vested interest in it uh, this is a, I, uh, I had a construction defect claim a few years ago with a client and that, that exact scenario occurred. The architect had a million dollar limit and that architect used to be and still is like the biggest multifamily uh, condo designer in town and they, they had a million dollar limit at the time. An eroding limit too. Yeah, an eroding limit that, you know, there was litigation on this project so the architect's lawyers are you know, the insurance company's paying the lawyers for the architect. By the time the litigation was settled, the architect had burned up $600,000 of a million dollar limit to defend the case. Well, unfortunately, my contractor had a $10 million limit, and this was before the, they, they approved the, the liability uh, law. Um, and, you know, we eventually settled it and it worked out okay, but we had a $5 million reserve on my client's books for several years. Um, because the carrier was concerned they were going to get caught in that same crossfire where, you know, there's no money there at the architect level. And so they'll blame a little bit on the contractor, and the contractor's sitting there with $10 million limit. So that can easily happen to anybody if you're not drilling down into the, the architect. Top player today is indemnification. <clears throat> so indemnity provisions generally uh, are designed to shift or allocate risk among the parties. And it's, <coughs> Doug was saying, usually to the party that is best able uh, to control uh, that risk. The kind of general tip, don't take on any, any risk that you are unable to control. If, if the risk is that some third party is going to do something, don't take on uh, the, the risk involved with that. Um, <coughs> client, also we have found that client driven, sorry, client drafted indemnity, indemnity provisions often exceed the limited contractual liability coverage available in insurance policies. Again, consult your broker. This is another provision that uh, the, the documents I mentioned, AIA and consensus docs, the, the indemnity language that's in those is 
consider to be fair and balanced between the parties, and it's fully insurable by uh, uh, for bodily injury or property damage um, by you know typical insurance policy. Um, these indemnities they get every and all and anything and uh, you know they get really super broad. Um, you know. There, there's just no way to ensure all the potential exposures that come out of, that arise out of that kind of language. Um, it's not to say that you won't ever sign one. It's not to say that we won't ever say, I get it, you know, you've got to sign it. But, uh, you, you know, in our experience, uh, particularly in good economic times, which we're in now, okay, 2009 and 10 when y'all were didn't have enough work to go around and you're scratching and clawing to keep your lights on and, and do what, get whatever kind of work you could to stay in business. Those days have changed a little bit, right? I and mean, it's common knowledge. Drive around Atlanta, you can't hardly not run into a tower crane if you're not paying attention. Um, in, in this kind of economic environment, there's much more of a, uh, a, a tendency or a flexibility for parties to negotiate some of this stuff. To a more reasonable level. I'm not say, going to say you're going to get everything you want. I'm not going to say the other side is going to get everything they want. But uh, there's certainly a, a premium right now on people who can perform, and and you know reasonable parties will tend to modify the most difficult of provisions in an environment like this. So even if that's not been your corporate culture, and, and we get it. I mean. I, if you don't have the leverage in the relationship, I mean, some folks that we deal with say, you know, I, I can't, they won't, if I don't sign it, I don't get the contract. You know, our, our, our experience is that, if, you know, if you push back and it's reasonable push back, you'll get some headway. Um, you know, if you don't ever push back, I, I know the answer to that. That's the only side that I know the answer to. You won't get anything except what it says. So we appreciate y'all's attention, and uh, hopefully there's some, some nuggets in here. Um, are there any questions on any of this? I mean, we, we, uh, this is something that we're, is near and dear to our hearts and our practice here. And uh, certainly if, if, we're, if we're working with you now and we're not in, involved in this stuff, um, you know, that's what we're here. That's a message to take away, if nothing else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it.